Greetings everyone and welcome to episode 4 of us playing as the Republic of Ukraine. I'm your host, Mr. Mugglover, but this time we're going to talk about the glory of Ukraine. Ukrainians find themselves presented with a false dichotomy. Either vote for a future of craving collaboration with Olublin and the movement for defense against Bolshevism, or one of fanatical militarism under the united struggle with Stus and Borovets. There's a third way, a more humane way. Ivan Dubya and a sculpturist movement preach a leftist nationalism and focus on what matters, while they fought for the war for Ukraine. Fascism must be defeated, but it cannot be done in such a heavy-handed manner. It can only be done so through a humanist program, one that reinvigorates the culture and flag torn to shreds. So what Zyubda offers a nation, a party that puts the Ukrainian people's lives what first for once. And uh, Zyubda will lead the Ukraine to new golden age of democracy and socialism. Now let's see what it's like. Prelude to politics. Politics is important, but how can it become come before the people looking for a decent meal if our people aren't able to be fed? How can they be expected to vote? Therefore, our culturist movement will be taking care of those crucial needs for the Ukrainian people first. Aid-driven and charity missions will be the drive for activist core of the time being, with Ivan Zyubia being the first front lines in delivering food and medicine to certain families, meaning his voters personally. So again, once again, like we did before, we have Barrel of the Gun. Um, should be relatively easy to do so, since last time we were playing as a Spivators and they needed m way too much help. So let's see if we can actually do this correctly. Or fairly, because if we can't, well, then oh well. Um, anything else here? We could do that one, but we're going to say it for now. We need more political power. It's always a problem. Uh, the cure to imperialism. Our people slaughtered, our land occupied, and our freedom squashed. The Nazi occupation was just the second time this great imperialist injustice fell upon the Ukrainian people. Another burdensome weight that they were forced to carry. We promise to make this right to attempt the impossible of trying to mend this hideous wound inflicted onto Ukraine and her people. We'll start by confiscating settler land, expelling the Germans, and detrimental all their foreign influences from it. The families that owned it for generations will finally see it return to them, as the least we can do, of course. And we have a couple of white tea here to keep us nice and satisfied. Security and imperialism, huh? Seems a little bit biased if we all get our positive stuff here. I mean, with the, the collaborators, all pretty much. Oh, we've got a few positive things, but not very many. Overall, seems a little biased. There goes Nidalanda. Goodbye. What else can we do here? Send up in the channel, of course. I'm do that one anyways. Food based electioneering. There's a call received from the secretary frantically summoning him to a horrorless office at Duba on Edge. There have been ma no masking the urgency behind her words and the threat that was therefore implied that he has made all haste. Entering the room, Zubia found to his immense distaste that Olobland was already present, red faced and clearly furious. As, of course, was often the case, the man jumped at Zubia's entry, shouting his usual venom, curses and all, accusations of corruption, profiteering, and grafts of all kinds. Most dangerously, though, was that of the so called blatant misuse of government food stock to add to his own election campaign. Zubia's retort was simple and direct. He was trying to assist his people to provide for the most basic needs during a time of great need. The election was ongoing, yes, but people still needed to feed their families. He's beside, he said with great relish, if Olo Blanc let to do the same, he would have been more than welcome to. The meeting and soon ended afterwards. Of course he won't. Lost and confused. Ukraine's scarlet fields. Scars linger all over Ukraine's body, unimaginable pain wrecked upon it after decades of occupation. The bloodshed, as experienced what had been previously been considered unfathomable, but it was now seemed normal. An acclimatization to the violence we've grown up with. We'll attempt restitution towards fixing all these ills and attempt to compensate the people for all they've lost, but in our hearts we know it will never be enough. So you can't even campaign as Spivators, which is honestly very biased against them, which makes sense somewhat, but still, like, come on. Nice, and we're just gonna grab these, because it doesn't really matter overall. The harvest we will reap. The Ukrainian peasant has striped against all. They are our greatest of workers and they deserve to be rewarded. We'll do all we can to get the farms working as efficiently as possible, as soon as possible. First, by clearing our lingering communist and fascist insurgencies that leech off their hard work. Secondly, by ensuring that they receive as much aid as possible with technical and agricultural resources and training being made as accessible as possible. For every Ukrainian family deserves a meal a day and this is the only way we can make that dream possible. The blood they shed. The horrors of Nazism have no comparison. As a murder machine that would have been considered a work of science fiction over 50 years ago, but now is our terrible reality. Reality and part of Europe. This part. 
We were able to drive it out of our nation, but the brutality it has inflicted upon us all lingers both physically and psychologically. We must come to terms with it. To this end, we'll expose these atrocities to the people. This perpetrator can no longer hide. Those who took part in the Holocaust are targeted and wiped away are once so proud Ukrainian Jews. Ivan Zubia will do his part making a speech condemning the Bobby Yard Massacre and a small token for his tens of thousands of screaming victims. Things happen, man. There you go. Convictions at the ravine. Standing just off stage, Zubia could feel history in the air. The crowd just outside, most from Kiev, but with some who had traveled from very far away indeed, filled the Babi Yar ravine. The location and the horrors which had taken place there during the original invasion were now well known. It had scarred so many families in the country. Even now, I found it difficult to read the words, how the action had been ever even accomplished. 30,000 people, Jews killed in the under 48 hours. Even beyond the human horror of the action, how it had even been logistically accomplished. Even barbarity found a way, he assumed, but as it was. As was being seen elsewhere, the suicidal nature of that evil always seemed to define its end stage. The scene to the near 100,000 people gathered and preparing to emerge, uh, or uh, Zubia felt, could feel along with this apprehension of a sense of total conviction. Ukraine could not, would not ever return to Nazi rule. The blood would be washed from its soil. This he believed. Oh. No one is sca sac sca sacred. And form the lost and confused. The Ukrainian people at large are akin to lost little lambs, confused in, in the dark after years of tyranny. After being bombarded with decades of, pro of propaganda, communist, Nazi, and banderite varieties, they are understandably mistrustful in politics and those who call themselves politicians. Directed by this, Ivan Zibia will take to the radio in a series of discussions and discourse aimed at educating the Ukrainian people on the culturalist movement. A special effort will be made to tailor these messages to younger audiences, where they are the most faithful and eager of converts. Nice. Mechanization and Expertise as was often the case for a Friday evening in the farming village. As the inhabitants gathered in a, sing in a single tavern, itself in addition to one of the wealthier farms' homes to discuss the events of the week. This week, though, all talk was on the new arrivals. The culturalists, as they call themselves, had arrived in a small settlement, pitched a grouping of tents just outside the collection of small houses that defined it. They had been speaking to each, each of them in turn over the last few days. It's claiming to be the agricultural experts, they had been quick to demonstrate the equipment they had brought with them with promises of more to come. Some of the villagers were greatly impressed. The village in it well, as it always had been quite poor, and the rare expensive machinery, including tractors, thrushers, and plowers of various types, promised massive increments in cultivation process or potential. The promise of more crops, a harvest, largest, a larger harvest, and thus more money, was intoxicating. But others dismissed the arrivals of the city folk who did not, could not understand their needs, who were far removed from life on the soil. The argument was how collegial in nature, and without resolution, soon discovered amidst the general cheer of the grouping, one day the result would become clearer, and they would all face it together as they always had. Wait and see. No percentage there. If anything, we probably should focus on this region next. Oh, oh, hello. Our great history. Look at all these benefits we get. It seems, honestly, feels a little biased because we like, all we get are benefits. I mean, there's a little bit of debt, but that's like nothing. No matter what the imperialists who have hailed as captive for so long try to say, the history of Ukraine is a beautiful tapestry that cannot be extinguished. From the courageous struggles of the noble Cossack people to the heroic victories and tragic defeats of the Ukrainian people's republic, it is a work of art. Every Ukrainian must be educated in its beauty. Furthermore, we must take great care to see the renaissance of our culture continue to blossom. We will do all we can to see this most treasured asset of ours bloom, whether it is through Ukrainianization policies or through continued struggle against the forces of fascism. Necessary subterfuge. For all his ideas of honesty and integrity, Zubiev knew that he could never be able to remain fully clean. The nature of politics now represented, and the folders sitting on his desk would simply not permit him. The folders and documents within him had been liberated from the reconstituted archives of the fallen Reichs Commissariat and contained information on his key opponents. In front of him, he held knowledge on both Oloblin and Bulba Borovitz, and he needed to decide which of them he despised more. Oloblin's file detailed the man's collaboration with the Nazis and its particular involvement with the massacre at Babi Yar. Bulba Borovitz's file detailed his best with Bandera, the OUN, and many anti Semitic atrocities carried out in his name. He wasn't sure what despised more the open fascism of Oloblin or the hollow fas anti fascism and hatred of Bulba -bo Borovitz. He dearly wished to destroy both men, but that was not possible, and a choice had to be made. He exposed Oloblen and hold blackmail over Bolo Borovitz's head, or vice versa. The decision kept him in the office late into night, but never ever again. The Baba Yar massacre was one of the greatest crimes of the 20th century. Our Jewish community was sent down to the ravine to be slaughtered like swan, and then the, that fascist Alexander Oloblen had the audacity to call himself a patriot when he was one of his main perpetrators. Happily, giving the Germans a list of names for who to kill, no more. 
Let's show the public what this fascist really represents. A thin covering of paint for Nazism. You'll see this monster for what he truly is, a spineless room who lets people die because of his cowardice and craven beliefs. When he comes at us with his pair of militaries, we'll strike back twice as hard, and the public will stand with us against the fascist beast that we should have we should have killed during the Civil War. Which personally I would like to do this one more, but let's see, no one is sacred. Theras Bubba Borovitz preaches anti fascism from any soapbox he can, his militancy is but a smoke screen. Thanks to our diligent efforts, we have extensive evidence showcasing his collaboration with German authorities and the OUM, enough to tear off his veil and expose the ugly beast for what he truly is to the public. They will see him for what he is, a hypocrite and a liar, the big hero acts strong and tough, but is nothing but an opportunist who turned away from Germany and the OUN when it either had no longer suited him or they didn't need him. We'll soon see how united the struggle really is after we broadcast our evidence onto all of Ukraine. We're going to go with Olopin, though. Yeah. They try to kill us. We survive, though. They may blind or crush her and throw her ashes into the sea, but she will always live. The Ukrainian nation is eternal. And uh, our people must take pride in that fact. We are the strongest people in the world. The Tsar tried to crush us and failed. The Communists tried to crush us and failed. And the Nazis tried to crush us and failed, too. They will come again to try and crush us, but they will fail, for we are an unbreakable people. These were the darkest of days, but dawn approaches in a brighter future for all of Ukrainians within our reach. Excuses. The idiot on the other end of the line was still holding forth, nattering away about something. Something to do with prevailing winds and painful realities. Olobin sighed and slammed the receiver down. The telephone topped off his desk, toppled off his desk from the force of the blow and fell to the floor, smashing open. With a grunt, Olobin kicked away the detritus and slumped back into his chair. Another donor gone, really bad needed money. Going elsewhere, and the only beneficiaries were those idiots Stuss and Zuba. The worst part about all this was that none of these wealthy landowners gave a single crap about the Jews. Heck, if they'd been a Bobby Yar, they'd probably man the guns themselves. But the Olobin, now under the spotlight for his own participation, the rest were smelling poison. He hadn't even bothered to look at the latest batch of polling. His base was unaffected, of course. Some were even congratulating Olobin for his part in the killings, but a hardcore of collaborators and out and out fast were never going to win an election for the Spivitori. The respectable, pragmatic Ukrainians that Olobin needed for that were now deserting him in mass. It was no longer Olobin the realist, it was Olobin the murderer. Olobin reached into his suit and brought out a small gray flask, his sole comfort these days, with everything else tumbling down and around him. Checking to see that nobody was around, he took off the cap and took a long, desperate swig. A few miles away, the grass in the ravine swayed slightly in the wind in the promise of knowledge. It was no secret that, under the previous occupiers, Ukrainian education was not considered important. It was, in many cases, considered dangerous, considered something to be suppressed, even when it was not. The dire economic conditions forced many children to leave, regardless. Uh, the boy looking at the shelf was one of the victims of, the, of that thought. Forced to leave school before the age of 10 in order to help his father and learn his trade, that of a cobbler, in order to support the family, he did not have the chance. In truth, he could barely read, and even that, then the words had to be simple. He accepted the state even though he knew there was something wrong, something unfair about it. But uh, that day on the shelf, he saw the pamphlet outside the town hall. The language within it knew its audience, and it was direct and simple. Taking it home, after the long day of work he began to read, the hours melted away. The tales of Cossacks, Pauls, and Communists all raced through him, and the spark that had been so long suppressed flared well, once more to life. He knew he would not stop, that he would seek out knowledge, and that with each tale, each story, each concept, he felt better about himself and about his place in the world. It was a very fulfilling feeling. Knowledge begets progress. Oh, look at that. Now we're up. Yeah, they're very biased towards the culturalists. Very, very biased. A clear light, not a twilight. The cultures are unstoppable. Every journalist and commentator knows that we will win this election by a country mile. Our golden cultural golden age approaches with a renaissance that would make the titans of Italy weep in despair once they see our mighty works. A new feature for Ukraine people has come, Ukrainian people, and we're ready to embrace it with open arms. But Germany still awaits. Our voices may be loud and proud, but will we be able to compete with them? Uh, well, we will always fight to the end, but will it be enough? A shadow of uncertainty looms over our nation, as even the most optimistic of us all wonders if our cultural revival will be all over before we can truly awaken our people. All we know is that our work will make it sure that Ukraine survives. If not as a country, it will live on in our hearts. Look upon your native country on this peaceful Eden. Love with overflowing heart, the expanse of ruin. Oh, Jones retreat, huh? Well, I'll give you some more hope as Ukraine, but... Still. Yeah, this is ridiculous. Are they, like, supposed to, like, destined to win? Maybe? The reconstruction of all types. Looking at his office window, Zubio was struck by the skyline of his beloved Kiev. He had been so used for so long as seeing it occupied, uh, chained and otherwise abused, so that as he ascended, almost seemed surreal. It looked like nothing like of Kiev six months ago. Buildings have been constructed, rubble cleared away. Trash swept up and distribution systems organized. Everywhere everywhere there was construction, expansion, development, and progress. Even the sky seemed sharper, more blue, more full of promise for what was going on underneath it. 
Well, it was far better than Zubia, it was an uh, improvement. In the city's physical condition than the condition of its inhabitants. It remembered the stolen, gray, beaten, and scared people shuffling back and forth under oppressive stairs and machine guns. No longer the case. The streets were full of Ukrainians on their way to work, to play, to live, and talk. They seemed so vibrant. Zubia knew that this Ukraine could have been had decades ago. And the thought enraged him, but now they had it the second best time, and the thought warmed his heart. He hoped with all of his being that this would continue. With any luck, it will. Good God, you're going to need a lot of luck for that. A Republic of Ukraine. As they have the general government here in Poland, and they're already puppet under a Wagner. And they have Austin over here, I mean, they broke. But then against where are we, a clear mind. There's a beauty in the crowd. They see a mass of people before you. United in purpose and determination. It is an intoxicating feeling as he stood on the rostrum. His voice booming out across the sea of humanity, Zuba's mind was on victory. Ukraine was making its wishes heard, and its millions of voices credited as one Zuba and the culturalist. Yes. The citizens of Kiev, a symbol for him, and their thousands were part of this great chorus. But the truly gratifying response came from the quiet and battered countryside. The peasants had heard the call, and they were responding, producing an unstoppable wave of culturalist votes that rendered the city almost insignificant. More than their votes, Zuba had the trust, and intended to reward that with trust with a thousandfold. His voice was electrifying even to himself, he could only imagine its impact on the people in the crowd. Words of hope, of persistence, persistence, of unity, promises of a Ukraine that could transcend the hellish decades behind them, but as he stood before the crowd, the very image of a triumphant orator, the still remained a small voice on the back of his head. The voice chanted his names to him, the ones that evoked very different images. Germany, Baba Yar, Er, Koch, Otto, Ollendorf, Adolf Hitler. They're not gone, the voice whispered to him, they will not come today, or tomorrow, or the day after, but they will come. And what then, uh, for your hope, your persistence, your unity? We still have negative growth. Of course, then again, I did delete the military. How do we have military expenses with no military? What are we paying for? The bouts crack open if you want to put that, please go ahead. But Ivan Zubia. Zuba. I'm probably saying it wrong. Yeah, look at that. Ridiculous. Don't be a struggle with the United Struggle, I tell you what. The Mandate. Zebo walked up to the head of the podium, a roaring crowd around him. He felt dizzy until now. He'd been a writer, a speaker, a thinker. Now, he was a president. As he joined the old allies on the steps of Kiev Rada, he stood amongst the elder titans of resistance, men who lived twice as long as him or more. Now he carried on their fight. Good people of Ukraine, the loudspeakers echoed his words far louder than he expected. I come to you today with the mandate to give you what you deserve, a proper nation, for too long. We've suffered under the chains of inhumane oppression, one which was not so just to steal our livelihoods, but our very souls. Their mission was to destroy our culture, mine will be to empower it. The thought of a German return sent murmurs throughout the crowd, perhaps a bad note. Beginning today, I promise that I'll give the Ukrainian people their nation back. No longer will you starve, no longer will you stand in, a bo in bondage. You'll be safe in the bosom of the Ukrainian nation, a bond shared between all of us, brothers and sisters. I thank you all for your support over this election. I hope that you'll support me as I work to make this dream a reality. The crowd erupted in cheers and Zuba ex exited so reeling. A promise was made today. Happy October, everybody. Feeding a nation, Mykola, I've come to enjoy this since joining the UNRA. You've been assigned to help Petro with the relief program. Aiding directly the communities most heavily hit by the war. The cultures had also been a major help getting everything set up. My colleagues in Petro campaigned for them on his days off. Their office in Kherson ended up filling with hungry refugees by the early morning each day, but the long hours were worth the cause. The Ukrainian people were finally free to live and express themselves to be nourished in every manner. Personally, I was an older Ukrainian woman. She was a regular. Petro was fairly certain her family had died during the war. She always left with a compliment, and my colleague made sure to, to sneak an extra piece of bread for her when he could. The second line was someone my colleague had never seen. It was a nervous, quiet child who was dressed unusually with a vest. The boy began to speak as Ukrainian stilted and uneven. My name is Zevdet. I came after Kramio, taken by Germany and I. Petro suddenly grew stern, surprising my colleague. Please step aside, child. This food is for strengthening the Ukrainian nation. The child did as he was told and began to walk away. My colleague noticed with a concern that he did not even seem surprised. Had this happened to him before? What a dreamless night. Columns of soldiers, miles wide, the capital light. Ivan Zuba couldn't stop thinking of it. What was to come? What had to come? The Germans would return. That was not yet clear proof of that fact, but it was still ob obvious to it on his face. The culture and civilization was based on eternal and everlasting oppression, and that would not end with the victories his government had managed. The, fi the fire of hate that burned within them could never be cooled. 
And when that day came, what would Ukraine do? He wanted to believe in that mystic answer. That such a battle would be a clash of cultures, one in which the nourishment of the Ukrainian people could reverse the attack and allow secure the, the nation and its freedoms. Yep. When he closed his eyes, he saw a battle of steel and flames, one in which Ukraine seemed doomed, doomed to lose. There may be an answer, but when Ziba closed his eyes, he could not see it. The great weight was on his shoulders, pressing harder and harder, and until an answer came to him, he could not bear to sleep. No dreams, only visions. And the Ukrainian culture was once regarded by the bureaucrats of Germany as a dormant symptom, soon to be swept away by the National Socialist cure during the 60s, now under the Republican time. It has seen its rebirth. Now, our from civil war. The Republic of Ukraine has escaped from the dreams into reality. The helmsman of this cultural revolution is Ivan Zuba, a leftist, populist, and most importantly, a nationalist. As well as to sustain the energy behind the revival of a once dying culture through his distinctive brand of politics. Their land will see the prosperity it, uh, it rightfully deserves, a land where Ukrainians are proud of who they are and the land where the nation can be perfected. But beyond these dreams of a Greek tomorrow, we we'll must wonder if Zuba knows how this new Ukrainian renaissance will survive Germany's inevitable return. But if you enjoyed this part of the campaign, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and see you tomorrow as we'll struggle with the United Struggle. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day!